can you guess this YouTube commenter's nomination for the greatest movie trailer of all time, a nomination that I happen to agree with. I'm going to read you some lines from the trailer in reverse order. As soon as you get it, hit like and subscribe right here on the Science Fiction channel. You are capable of deciding your own destiny. The question is, which path will you choose? I've been waiting for this day my whole life. This day of reckoning. We will experience fear, fear, in the face of certain death. Your father was captain of a starship for 12 minutes. He saved 800 lives. I dare you to do better. That was, of course, the J.J. Abrams 2009 reboot of Star Trek. I love that trailer. I've watched it many times. I know that many Star Trek fans love it just as much as I do. And I think that's because it seems to encapsulate everything that we love about Star Trek. This is brave adventurers facing the fears of the unknown, determining their own destinies using the cutting edge of science and tech Technology. What I want to explore in this video essay today is why that trailer and the values it represented were so popular. Whilst the J.J. Abrams reboot movie and much of the Star Trek that has followed has been so disappointing to many of us. And the idea that I want to explore is that Star Trek was a peak narrative of modernity, not just in its use of the cutting edge of science and technology, but in that it represented the ability of the individual using technology to go out into the unknown and shape it for our own best purposes. This is all about what the age of modernity was about, the values of the modern world. But what we got in the J.J. Abrams reboot was not a peak narrative of modernity at all. Just that word, the fact that they rebooted Star Trek, gives you a very clear idea of what the new values of Star Trek were going to be. The reboot, the eternal retelling of stories is a core quality of post-modernity. And from the J.J. Abrams 2009 reboot onwards, Star Trek was going to become ever more post Modern. You don't have to look very hard on the internet and beyond to find people complaining uh, about new Trek. Very often these complaints focus on quite valid issues with the values in the storytelling, for instance, of Star Trek Discovery, which takes that uh, brave crew of adventurers and turns them into something like uh, complaining millennials who instead of facing the fear of the unknown are continually turning to each other for support in the face of the ultimate fears. These are at least the complaints that I see or the complaints about Jean-Luc Picard, who in the words of my good friend John Viveki, was uh, the epitome of the philosopher king as defined by the great philosopher Plato, who was able to make wise decisions whilst dealing with the realities of power. That was the philosopher king that we were given in the body of Jean-Luc Picard, who in the Picard series, at least in seasons one and two, seems to be, uh, instead of a stoic philosopher king, a man who is lost in his own uh, childhood traumas and is unable to make 
any longer effective decisions. And I think these complaints from many fans are entirely valid. If you go into the slightly more extreme complaints about Star Trek over in what I call the angry nerd bro, the critical drinker uh, or nerd rotic or many others in that space, you'll see continually repeated the idea that a woke conspiracy has taken over Star Trek to spread the message. I think that extreme critique is somewhat less valid, unless we think about what's meant by the word woke in this context. If you go over to somewhat more serious critical thinkers... You need to understand postmodernism because that's what you're up against, and you're up against it far more than you know or think and it's a much more well-developed and uh, pervasive, pernicious, nihilistic, intellectually attractive doctrine than has yet like come to public Jordan realization. Jordan Peterson, for instance. I really appreciate Jordan Peterson's uh, criticisms, his history of looking uh, at myth and storytelling and the nature of archetype and symbolism. I'm a bit less appreciative of his newer identity as a culture warrior over on the conservative right, but putting my judgments aside, I think when Jordan Peterson connects woke with postmodernism, that that's quite correct, that what people are largely talking about with this word woke or wokeism or a woke conspiracy is the emergence of postmodern values into our world. But there's something a little bit ironic, uh, both in the angry nerd bro shouting about wokeism and in Jordan Peterson himself with his critiques of postmodernism, that these are all deeply postmodern individuals. They are individuals who are uh, examining the narratives of our new online culture and in a way speaking to and appealing to those narratives, which is the epitome of postmodernism. Well, you're right, Mr. Jones. They don't like Klingons. To understand the movement of Star Trek from modern to postmodern values, we can divide the entire franchise into roughly four phases. A brief phase of original Star Trek. Star Trek was always a weird television show. In that run from 66 to 69, nothing else like it with its primary colored characters going on adventures into uh, space, boldly going into the unknown. Nothing like it had been seen before. The key word here is that Star Trek was original. The main second phase of Star Trek, which goes from roughly the motion picture uh, in uh, 1979 through to the early 2000s and Star Trek Enterprise and encapsulates that uh, tremendous period that is the Star Trek that most people know and love. The original Star Trek movies, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. And this is when Star Trek was really defining its identity. We've gone from entirely original to a definitional period for Star Trek. And then we go to, of course, in 2009, the J.J. Abrams reboots. And there is nothing more postmodern than rebooting the stories of the past. And not just rebooting, placing into an alternate Kelvin verse reality where the brave adventurers are no longer as significant because they're just in an alternate world reality. And then the phase of Star Trek that we're now in that begins the age of disco and Alex Kurtzman who brings an entirely post modern sensibility to Star Trek. Uh, that from Star Trek Discovery into Picard and in a slightly different way in Strange New Worlds 
Star Trek has adopted the core agenda of postmodernist thinkers, which is very much about rewriting those modernist values that Star Trek once represented and instead replacing them with profoundly postmodern values, where these are no longer brave adventurers facing the unknown. They are now much more uncertain. They are much morally grayer figures. And they are even no longer explorers, but colonialists. People who are going out and exerting their power over the galaxy. And what is most significant about these four phases of Star Trek is how, over that period of 50 years, Star Trek becomes ever more self-reflective, feeding on its own path. Star Trek becomes ever more hyper-real, one of the core concepts of postmodernism. Okay, let me explain the hyper reality. This is an important concept in Baudrillard. Reality is simply that which can be simulated. Can't be simulated, it's not real. Clearly, something significant has changed, and it has affected the very nature of what selves are, what humans are, what subjects are. When I talked about how my students had no dreams, I mean, what is there left to dream? When I was a kid, I dreamed about dinosaurs. I had a little Walt Disney dinosaur book. Why would I need to dream about dinosaurs now? Steven Spielberg has made them. He's filmed them. They're more real than real dinosaurs. They're hyper real. Imagine a tidal wave, a vast force of change rushing towards you in the modern world. On the shore are a small number of figures saying, watch out, there's a tidal wave of change coming. The figures on the shore are the postmodernist thinkers and the ideology of postmodernism. The tidal wave rushing towards the modern world is post-modernity, not just a set of ideas, but a new era of human culture and human civilization, bringing with it both huge benefits and enormous change. And with change comes fear. But very often, the quite valid fears and anxieties about the new era of post-modernity are directed at the post-modernists, who are not creating this change. They're simply warning about its approach. To understand the era of post-modernity and its impact on Star Trek, I want to read you a quote from one of the great postmodernist thinkers, Jean Baudrillard. Postmodernity is said to be a culture of fragmentary sensations, eclectic nostalgia, disposable simulacra, and promiscuous superficiality, in which the traditionally valued qualities of depth coherence, meaning, originality, and authenticity are evacuated or dissolved amid the random swirl of empty signals. The era of post-modernity is created by fundamental changes in our media, in the empty signals that now surround us. We have transitioned from an era of about 500 years of mass centralized media to a new era of decentralized digital media. The modern era 
where powerful authorities or corporations like the CBS Media Company and Paramount Studios could create stories like Star Trek, place them into cinemas, broadcast them on televisions, and almost everybody in the world would see the same stories to just a few decades later when everyone is a publisher. Everyone is telling stories on social media. And those great authorities, even the giant entertainment corporations like Paramount CBS, are now struggling to be heard. And so they are turning to entertainment franchises. Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones. These franchises are more central to the power of these old centralized authorities than they ever were before. But that means they can no longer just be Star Trek. Instead, these stories are now corporate entertainment franchises. These brands that were built before the new era of decentralized digital media are like a life draft that these corporations are clinging onto and in the process destroying. The drive to turn Star Trek into a corporate entertainment franchise to generate ever greater consumer profits is what's really destroying Star Trek in the era of post-modernity. Jean Baudrillard predicted this effect of the corruption of our stories in his idea of hyper-realism. And Star Trek has gone from being an original story in the late 1960s to an increasingly hyper-real simulacra of the Star Trek that we knew and love. And this process of hyper-realism is driven by these powerful but now failing corporate entertainment franchises. There is a postmodern destruction of Star Trek, but it is not being driven by a very small number of postmodern critics from the 1960s like Jean Baudrillard or Jack Derrida or Foucault. It's not being driven today by a very small number of woke activists who may have some small power in Hollywood. That postmodern destruction is being driven by the great corporate entertainment franchises as they try to cling on to their centralized control of media in the face of the tidal wave of post-modernity that has crashed upon the modern world in the form of decentralized digital media. How can we save Star Trek from this culture war conflict uh, between those of the modernist mindset who seek to preserve the values that Star Trek once encapsulated uh, and those of the post-modern mindset who are trying to adapt Star Trek to the new era of post-modernity? The argument I've made in a number of places now is that we need to turn to meta-modern values for our storytelling. We need Star Trek to be neither the old Star Trek of the past, which is where I'm afraid Strange New Worlds fails in turning Star Trek into a nostalgic return to the 1960s. That can't answer the question for us, as fun as Strange New Worlds is. Uh, neither can we allow Star Trek to simply be overwritten with the values of post-modernity. We need a meta-modern Star Trek that values both the modern and the post-modern and brings them together into a new integration. And I will make an 
actionable prediction that when Star Trek is once again powerful in our culture, it will be because it is metamodern, encapsulating both the modern and the postmodern into a new metamodern Star Trek. If you want to learn more about metamodernity in storytelling, go and look at this video essay about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse.